Hey guys, big webinar alert this Wednesday, 7 o'clock. It's a good one. How to market your show with no money. How to get attention, how to sell tickets, how to do all those things without spending a dime. This Wednesday, 7 o'clock Eastern. Check out the details at theproducersperspective.com. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Producers Perspective podcast. I'm Ken Davenport. I'm very excited to have in our podcast today one of the most important figures in nonprofit theater on the planet, the artistic director of the famed Manhattan Theater Club, Lynn Meadow. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you, Ken. So how did you get started in the theater? In New York or in my life? In your life. Where'd you get bit by the bug? I got bit in the basement of Temple, Michigan, Israel, when I was a little girl. And in most synagogues, they have a room downstairs from the main synagogue where kind of a an auditorium. And my mom was very interested in the theater, and she wrote a New Faces for whatever year it was when I was like four years old. And I remember walking in and looking at what was going on on the stage. And I thought that is really just the most fun. That looks more fun than anything. And so I got bit by the bug very early. And I grew up in New Haven, where when I was uh, a child, there were no women undergraduates at Yale University. So when shows were being done at Yale, at the Yale Dramat, they would use local women to be in shows. So I was cast when I was 12 years old in a musical that was written by David Shire and Richard Maltby. And it had a great company of people in it. Austin Pendleton was in it, Sam Waterston, a woman named Carrie Nye. It was directed by a brilliant director named Bill Francisco. And... Bill Francisco would go on to become very acclaimed in New Haven, but then he went back to Wesleyan, where he had gone to school as an undergraduate. And he is the person, he's the reason that I became a director in the theater, because he was just so talented and so charismatic. And what he was doing just looked like so much fun. But he went, he continued his career at Wesleyan, where he was a teacher and mentor. And the, um, a person whom he mentored in the theater is, uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda. So Lynn Manuel and I laughed to say that we had the same mentor. He certainly was the reason I decided to become a director. Really, as a, a, a young girl, I just thought that seemed fabulous. So even at, uh, you were quick to jump off the stage as an actress and say, I want to direct. So what was it about directing that appealed to you? Well, I think the theater itself was just, you know, it was a, a moth to the flame. I mean, I, I I grew up in New Haven where I would see shows at Yale, and every once in a while I would be taken into New York to see a play. And, of course, I wanted to be an actress. I didn't. I knew that directing seemed fascinating and this man seemed fascinating and what he was doing moving people around on the stage seemed fascinating. But I think it wasn't until I realized that I had no talent whatsoever as an actress that I knew that it was directing that was for me. That was in the eighth grade homeroom play where Mr. O'Reilly was having trouble directing the show. And so I said, Mr. O'Reilly, I, I can help you. So I may be, I don't know, how old are you in eighth grade? 11 or something. So... I guess it was then. Well, at least you discovered it early. I know many actors that are still not uh, discovering that they should be doing something else at a much older age. How did you go about pursuing a career in directing? Well, I, I went, you know, I, I acted in college and I acted in high school. And then I also directed. I went to Bryn Mawr College and I directed, you know, there's a freshman show that people had to write and an original show. And so I got everybody together to do that. And I directed that. And as I say, I refer to New Haven a lot of times, but it was the presence of the Yale School of Drama that seemed to me like, you know, Emerald City. That was that was the place that I wanted to go. So I studied French as an undergraduate, and I spent some time in Paris and learned how to speak French. And but still, the the beacon called, and I wanted to study directing at Yale. And when I was in my senior year, I applied to the Yale School of Drama as a, a director. And I was put on the waiting list. They said I was the first person on the waiting list, but I, I hadn't been accepted. And I, I was horrified, Can I really, because it was really all I dreamed of. I didn't even really dream of New York. I dreamed of going to the Yale School of Drama, and I didn't really have many plans after that. 
So I got on a train from Philadelphia and I asked if I could, I had asked if I could meet the dean to talk about what had happened. I just couldn't believe I hadn't been accepted. And I went up to New Haven, and this was back in 1968, and I met with Gordon Rogoff, who was the dean, and I said, I, I just don't understand why I wasn't accepted. He said it was incredibly competitive. There were over 500 applications for four or five places, he said, so it was very, very competitive. And this was 68, so I was pretty naive. There was no women's movement that I knew of. And so I naively said, well, did you accept any women? And he said, he paused. He said, no, as a matter of fact, we didn't. And I said, well, is that the reason that you turned me down? He said, well, we haven't had that much luck with the couple of the women who we had accepted here. I repeat, 1968, things were different. And, but my, my spirit and my, my zeal were born out of my passion to want to direct for the theater, not out of a political sense. And I, after I graduated, I went to work at the center stage in Baltimore as a wonderful man named Peter Coleman, who's the executive director. And I worked as his executive assistant for a week and uh, I went into his office I said this is just not going to work out this is not this is not where I want to be I really want to be a director and anyway I wrote a very long impassioned letter to the dean at Yale explaining why I thought a woman could really do as good a job as a man could do maybe different but that I felt that I could really do a good job. And I described what I felt my qualities were that would allow me to succeed. And two days later, I got a phone call. They said that I had been accepted. And the person, I was the first person on the waiting list, and I guess someone decided not to come. So I was accepted at Yale. And I think that story is important to me because I think, I think what I wanted to do and what I what I had, as I say, what I had a passion for doing is something that women really were not doing anywhere. I didn't really have a role model. I had heard about Zelda Fitch Handler in Washington, and I'd heard there was a woman named Nina Vance who ran a theater, and I knew Ellen Stewart's name. And that really was all. And I remember seeing at the Schubert Theater in New Haven, there was a repertory company run by Eva Legallian. And I saw a few shows that were done and that she had, I guess she had directed them. I had a little trouble with some of them. I think the, some of the quality was up to what I imagined, but I didn't have a role model. And I think one of the things that I, I feel very proud of what my career has been, but one of the things I feel most proud of is that I think I really cut a path for so many talented women who now have come and are doing such great work in the theater and so I feel as if, you know, I, I, I did something that was not my intention to do, but I think by exemplary action, one can make a difference in, in, in creates social change, and in this case, artistic change. And so it makes me very proud to see the kind of work that's being done by women, women directors and, and women artistic directors. So that was 1968. So... How are we doing today in, in including women in the what was, what still is, as deemed by many, the, the boys' club of both directors, writers? How do you think, take our temperature today? I think it's not a, a boys' club anymore. I mean, I think there are powerful women who've made an, an incredible difference in so, so many aspects of the theater, directing, producing, writing. So I, I feel like we always need to get better and we certainly can't rest on our laurels. And I think we see as social change happens, sometimes there's a setback. And so there's no reason to be complacent by any means. I, I think there can there, sexism still exists, just as racism still exists. We're seeing that in our world. But, but we've made tremendous progress since my tenure at Manhattan Theater Club. The landscape is completely different. And the landscape around America. I mean, when I was the artistic director, 
the Manhattan Theater Club back in 1974, I, I didn't have, there were no other women artistic directors to have a conversation with. I was talking to Gordon Davidson and Arvin Brown and John Jory and all the people were men. And that certainly has really changed. Tell me, what's the day in the life of an artistic director today? What do you find you're spending most of your time on? Oh, <laughs> my heaving a sigh. You know, there's so many things to, you know, I have, with my partner, Barry Grove, whom I hired a few years into my tenure as artistic director, with him, you know, we've created a, a large institution that produces a, on a on a large scale, just in terms of the number of shows that we do on a on as small a budget as we can do it on, because we raise them, we have to raise the money every year to do the shows that we do. But the combination of the demands of producing, of reading material, choosing material, casting material, putting shows on, along with everything else that's attached to an institution from our... One of the things that I felt strongly about many years ago was that we needed to have an educational outreach program. And and I think I asked a friend of mine who'd been a director at the Yale School of Drama if he would head up our program. His name is David Shukoff, and he's he's just been a genius. He's he's the dean of education in New York and, then, uh, and has created so many programs for outreach. So there's that program and there's raising money for that program. And there's, you know, we're constantly, we're doing benefits. We do two benefits a year. So we have to put on shows to do the benefits and there's meetings with boards of directors and there's, you know, conversations with artists and attending run throughs of shows that you're not directing. And, working on designs for shows. I'm directing a new show starting after the first of the year. So there's meetings, pre-production meetings on that. I, I think there's a trend, and I, I know you've spoken to Andre Bishop and Todd Hames in, in your other podcast. I think there is a trend that has emerged where people who are running theaters are artistic directors are not necessarily stage directors. And I have tremendous esteem and, and regard and respect for my colleagues, Todd Haynes and Andre Bishop and Oscar Eustace, you know, and, and all of the artistic directors in New York who are, you know, were, there's just so much talent in the city. But I think I, I'm, I'm wary of trends emerging where boards of directors feel that nonprofit institutions artistic institutions should be run by business people. I think the heart, and one, and I have a great partnership with Barry Grove, who, as I say, has been my partner for many years now. But I think the heart of an artistic institution is the art and the mandate, the mission, what the theater is about is about art and everything else is in support of that. And I think we just have to keep our eye on that and make sure that particularly when we're holding out our hats and saying, support these institutions, there's something going on here that's different than what's different from what's going on in other parts of the theater. We work very closely with the commercial theater and their co-productions with the commercial theater, but our mission is to use the money that we make from a show or money that we raise that our mission is to take that money and use it to produce the next thing that we're doing our mission and our goal is not to to make our shows financially successful and at the end of the day if you're producing in the commercial theater your obligation is to create a success that doesn't mean there is an incredible artistic excellence and great success, but success or failure is based on, did the show recoup? Did the show make the money that it makes? And our measure of success in a not-for-profit setting here is, it's a different metric system, so that a show can be, at the Manhattan Theater Club, can be not financially successful, but successful in in, in many other ways. A playwright is discovered who's going to write two plays from now is going to write a really successful play. Actors are discovered who are 
going to have major careers or one, we are going to be instrumental in helping those careers. So there are a lot of other measurements of what constitutes success in a, in a not-for-profit theater, and we have to make sure that the, the art stays at the center of that and not just the idea of business and survival. Again, not to de de denigrate in any way the need for sound business practices and really being buttoned up and and responsible and responsible to a board of directors and responsible to people who are giving you money to to spend the money very carefully and and frugally frankly so but it, it's definitely a difference and i guess i'm waving the flag for making sure that the art and our raison d'etre which is producing work for the theater whether it's going to be successfully whether it's going to be successful financially or not, that's what our job is. That's why we're doing benefits and saying, please contribute to us because the playwright that you chose today, who may have a flop, maybe will turn around and write something brilliant two plays from now. And I've I've seen it happen. I've made it happen. I've stood by so many artists over the years, um, so many so many careers that. I've stood behind, and I've I've seen what happens when success is not based upon a certain kind of metric. Yeah, I, that is one of the things I so admire about nonprofits, but especially MTCI, because I've seen this over my 20 plus years in the city, where I see a show that doesn't work, but I can tell it's about the writer. Talk to me about how you pick a season in general, about what goes into that process. Well, I think it's interesting because I, I often bristle at this word for, um, when people say, my partner says, have you picked the season yet? Well, a season actually is created. It's created because it doesn't, it's not like it's an apple on a tree out there saying, and you're looking at which apple and which pear, and you say, oh, I think I'll do that one. There are so many elements to producing a season and to starting with what the material is, starting with who's going to be in it, who's going to direct it, who's going to design it. All those elements that you put together are the things that is what's called producing. Then, of course, there's the, the issue of raising money, but that's hardly, that's a portion, and it's a big portion, but it's not the only portion of producing a show. And it takes a long time, and and we use many, I use many criteria for making selections. One of them is, you know, to create a diverse season. The first thing on my, my mind is always quality and excellence. I'm looking for voices in the, in the writers and in the directors whom I hire in addition to myself. I'm looking for artists who have great talent and I'm looking for writers who have a voice and I'm looking for work that in some way is going to speak to us now, something that I respond to and that hopefully other people will respond to. So, you know, it takes it takes a long time to do it. And um, sometimes I wish it were like an assembly line. You could say, well, I'll take that one, that one, and that one. Like, you know, the way we go look at those cupcakes in the Magnolia store and say, that one looks good, and that one looks good, and I think I'll do that. And I think when you're not producing premieres, American premieres, world premieres, or New York premieres, it's probably a little bit different because I think if you're doing new work and you're doing that, outside New York City uh, in another in another city. I don't think it's easier to be an artistic director, but I think it's different because you can look at some of the work that's been created and endorsed and that you've seen in New York and say, well, I think I'd like to do a production of that. That feels to me like picking. Well, I think when you're putting it together for the first time, that to me feels like creating. So you've obviously been at BC for several decades now. So you <laughs> hundreds. Have hundreds of decades. <laughs> so what's the biggest change you've seen in your role as an artistic director over those decades? What, what are you doing today that back when you first started, you never would have imagined you'd be spending your time on? You know, I think over the history of my career, there have been things that I've gotten involved in that I, I never would have believed I would have to understand or deal with, starting with the complicated financial statements that we prepare for our board, um, just even understanding that. You know, there's a, a story when I was interviewed, I had directed a play at what, what was incorporated as the Manhattan Theater Club, 
and this was back in the early 70s when I, well, I, I'm on a leave of absence from Yale. I left after two years, and I'm still on that leave of absence. So I was in New York, and uh, I went to this place, Manhattan Theater Club, and I put on a play, and some members of the board of directors saw it, and they and I was asked if I wanted to be the artistic executive director. And I, it was a decision. I had a tough decision to make because I had been walking by the cheese department at Zabar's. I lived on the Upper West Side, and I, I kept stopping and saying, "Don't you need someone to?" work in the cheese department. I needed a job badly. So then the Manhattan Theater Club came along and they wanted to interview me as uh, artistic director. And I thought, well, I say bars or Manhattan Theater Club. Anyway, so I was interviewed by the board of directors and I had been a French major, as I think I mentioned at Bryn Mawr, and I graduated with honors. My French was good. I didn't have a math course when I was there. They now have a major. And so the board, during this interview, showed me what the budget was at the time. And I think I maybe even knew that I should ask to see it. That seemed like it would be like a prudent thing to do if you were, because it was artistic and executive. So I said, well, gentlemen, can I see your financial statement? So I, I looked at it and I looked down the page. And I said, this is very interesting. I saw words that I didn't even know what they were. I knew what Con Ed was, but I didn't know what cartage was and I, I learned afterwards that was how they got rid of the garbage and then I got to the bottom page I said this is a very interesting budget I see you have $75,000 but why do you have a parenthesis around the number so they hired me anyway <laughs> I had no idea what a de deficit was I I had a, I had a checking account and I did manage to pay my rent but they went ahead and hired me. So this is the story of where I was then and where I am now. I, I can't tell you that I am sophisticated in our accounting. I, I hear about when we're having audits and I, I try not to nod off during that time. So, but I under, I understand a lot about, I think, managing and making choices that are actually prudent financially. But that's one thing I didn't imagine I'd ever do. I mean, after that $75,000 number and the, the, I, they looked at me in a very strange way. They did have to explain, well, that's money we don't have, Lynn. So I explained to them that I thought it was not a good idea to do a benefit and lose money. That seemed to me conceptually misguided. So that was one of my uh, executive, first executive decisions. Let's do a benefit and make some money. Let's not do a benefit and lose money. So... In a way, that's the best answer they ever could have asked for because interviewing an artistic director that doesn't know what a deficit is, you only work with a surplus. Exactly. How, how has uh, having the Biltmore changed MTC? I think that was huge. I mean, this is now our 13th season, but we started, when I started, I was on 73rd Street between 1st and 2nd, and we had a home there for about the first 10 years. Then we we moved through a crazy series of legal things where it's probably too we, we would need three more podcasts to go into what happened when we tried to buy the building and we lost the building and anyway we ended up at midtown on 55th street where we still have a theater at city center we built two theaters there and we were there until late at the end of i think by we we were already breaking ground by early 2000s. So it's been our, as I say, it's our 13th season now in 2016. And so for the last, so at, when we were off Broadway, off, at off Broadway only, we were doing a tremendous amount of work, plays and playwrights whom I supported from Terrence McNally to John Patrick Shanley to Dave Auburn to Charles Bush, some, Donald Margulies, so many of the writers with whom I chose to work and whose work I chose to direct and or produce were having plays that were moving either off Broadway, we were moving them off Broadway, or and occasionally they would move to Broadway. Terrence McNally's we moved Terrence McNally's play Love Valor Compassion to Broadway in uh, nineteen ninety five. And so we were working in the Broadway arena slightly and so, and working off Broadway and it was Barry's strong feeling that we should have our own Broadway home. And so we looked for a number of years, and Barry was tireless in the search, and, and I joined him on this. And and when we embarked on this, you know, I had trepidation about how could we stay who we were. The, the reason that I had become the artistic leader 
of this institution? Could, could I continue to do the work that interested me the most and be on Broadway? And so it's the last 13 years have been an incredible learning curve where I think we've been able to sustain an identity as a company that is a risk-taking company, um, a company that is supportive of writers. I think we've been able to, I, it's been a real learning curve for me of how to do that and and create work that's at a level that it should be on Broadway in the sense of being able to draw a large enough audience. And it's it's definitely been a challenge. But I think with Barry's efforts in terms of finding a new audience and galvanizing that audience and obviously starting with my own efforts of making choices about what we would do and whom we would support and and keeping in mind that we had to be prudent financially, that we couldn't go out of business doing this. What, what was shocking was how much money we could lose really quickly on a show on Broadway as opposed to on a show off-Broadway. So, you know, it's been fascinating. It's really... I, I don't think I I ever would have imagined that this is what I would do. I, I really was stage-struck. I, you know, I fell in love with the theater and I wanted to direct shows. And I think the rest has been sort of a way that I can do that. And, you know, how can I go and work in the theater every day. And sometimes I really, I, I have to pinch myself because I think, well, a, as arduous as it can be to be at this seven days a week for so many years, I've gotten to do it. And I've gotten to be around theater people who are the people I love being around the most other than my immediate friends and my husband and my son. There's just nothing like being with actors and other directors and designers and I, I feel very blessed. I've gotten very sentimental now. I feel incredibly blessed and particularly in the world that we're living in now of what all of us who work in the theater feel, which is we have the opportunity. I feel that I have the opportunity to say something and to and a platform to do something and and I think maybe one of my real talents has been to discover talent and to give people a chance and and how rewarding that is and what a blessing that is just to be able to do that. So I feel bad for all, all the no's that I've said, but I feel very, very grateful for the yeses that I've been able to say and the number of people who've walked through rehearsal halls here and been on our stages and, and the careers that they've had. So I'm not, I, I sound as if I've gotten sentimental and... I'm looking back, but I'm doing that for two minutes while I'm talking to you. And the minute I stop talking to you, I'm going to go upstairs and say, okay, what are we doing now? Because I actually don't like to look back too much. I, I'm much more interested in what are we doing tomorrow and who's what's going on and how are we going to cast this? And let's try to get the rights to that. So I was going to, in that spirit, I was going to ask you to look back upon your, uh, your many productions here and ask you your... If the Smithsonian, one of my James Lipton questions, if the Smithsonian could put one of your shows, MTC shows, in the Institute, which one would you choose? But I'm not going to ask you that. You can answer it if you want, but you don't like to look back. So I'm going Well, to I can't choose because, frankly, there has been... I think if you look at the history of the Manhattan Theater Club over the over 40 years that I've been here, there has been an amazing amount of really fine work that has come from this institution and that has come as a result great people wanting to work here and my being, you know, awake enough to say yes the number of times that I have. So I can't choose. I mean, there are so many writers with whom I've worked as a director whom I love and so many terrific writers. And I, how, I, how can I begin to choose? I will make you. Okay, thank so you. So let's look ahead. What are you most excited about coming up for MTC? Is there something that you're like, really, oh my gosh, we've discussed, I can feel it in my bones. This is it. I think it's, you know, it's what we're doing tomorrow. You know, we're opening Heisenberg, Simon Stevens play that we commissioned and we opened in our small 150 seat theater that opens... Tuesday, September 20th at 
The Friedman Theater starts it be, previews. It will be in previews by the time previews. this podcast goes live. Great. So if that's starting. A play by by Queen Nguyen is starting. Viet Gone at City Center. A new play by Sarah Jones is starting at City Center. So that's my reality right now. And I'm really excited about the play I'm directing by Penny Skinner called Linda. And that I start after the first of the year. So I guess I'm just in a state of excitement most of the time looking at what's coming next. It's always different. How do new writers get in front of someone like you? What are, what's your advice to writers out there that were like, oh my gosh, if only Lynn Meadow would just read my script? Well, we, you know, we have a process here and uh, an artistic development office. So we read uh, scripts and we do a lot of readings and we, people are, we are seeing plays that are being done around New York. We see plays that are being done around the country and we have, you know, I have great advisors who are saying, let's take a look at this. What if a young uh, listener out there said, um, I want to start a theater company? What would you advise them to do in 2016? I would say get a lot of sleep (laughs) before your first day because you won't sleep again. And I would say don't let anyone tell you you can't do it or that it's too hard or that you shouldn't or that it exists or that it it isn't a prudent thing to do because you, you really have to ignore all the reasons not to do it and follow your heart and say, if you want to do it, you, you must go ahead. And you every day you face the challenges and you try to look ahead and plan and make a five-year plan of where you think you'd like to be and then throw that out because it probably won't turn out to be that way. I think you have to have the kind of determination and will and unwillingness to to fold in the face of bad notice, financial challenges. I, I think you just have to persevere. What is it the I Ching says? Perseverance furthers. You, you just can't you can't give up because it's if it's something you have to do, then you you have to do it. And and I think we've seen examples of that. You know, anybody getting any sort of show on is is such a triumph. Just to get to opening night of one show is a triumph. But in my worldview, nothing seems better than watching the curtain go up the first night. And and on Broadway, every time we have an opening night and those people with the the cameras go running down the aisle to snap pictures, it's like on that 12-year-old girl again in Richard Maltby's musical, singing my heart out and being so excited that this is what I get to do. So you you really have to just have a lot of determination and not be willing to take no for an answer. That's what my mother used to say to me when I was a kid. She would yell at me and say, why can't you take no for an answer? And I I thought that might be if I ever wanted to write a, a book or a pamphlet about my life, I think I would call it, she didn't like to take no for an answer. Okay, my last question. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes to visit you and knocks on your door and says, Lynn, I want to thank you for your incredible contributions to the theater. You have built an incredible institution that has changed theater all over the world, without a doubt. And this is Ken talking as well as the genie now. But the genie says, has the power to grant you one wish to say thank you. What's the one thing that drives you crazy about Broadway or about New York theater in general? It gets you so mad. You're so, you're, you're so passionate. You love what you do. But there's got to be something that drives you. The pounding the table's angry keeps you up at night that you'd ask this genie to wish away. I'm not sure it keeps me up at night because it's a more sustained concern, if you will. It's not an emotional rage about anything because I've kind of let those go. But I do feel concerned about making sure that ticket prices are such that people have access to the theater because I do think the theater is transformative and changes lives. And whether we're seeing, this is about Broadway only, the the genie would change something having to do with Broadway. The New York theater environment in general. I, I think my concern is to to make sure that we're reaching the next generation and that we're providing for a theater audience that is willing to come in to the theater and turn off cell phones 
and sit for a period of time and listen to the spoken word and also see material that's exciting and that represents concerns and issues and ideas and fun that the next generation wants. But I, I think that the audience has to be there. We, we exist. We're an art form that's popular. We exist with an audience in the present moment. And I just, I, I would like the genie to just make sure that we're bringing people in to see the, all the incredible work that's going on in the theater now. I mean, all over New York, on Broadway, off Broadway, off, off Broadway, there are, there's great work happening here and in New York City, and certainly all over the country. Right now, we're talking about New York City. So I just hope people, we can provide access to people who will then grow up and have kids and bring their kids and, you know, let somebody fall in love with the theater just the way I did. It's a fantastic answer. And I want to thank you for your contributions to the theater. I definitely want to put a plug in for that book. Please write that book. I will read it <laughs> and I will push it to everyone out there as well. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you for listening. And we will see you next time. Don't forget this Wednesday, 7 o'clock, how to market your show with no money. The webinar, 7 o'clock, Wednesday night. Get all the details at theproducersperspective.com, including how to take it for free.